let you know. <laughs> so the goal is to streamline and become a bit more efficient. So we are still in the process of, especially with Oracle coming online, making sure that we receive the information and build it in a way such that we can look at the metrics and the data and have real time access to uh, that information so it can drive um, the operation in each individual department. So I was saying, I heard the P, right, backing up. <laughs> So um, with that being said, uh, the goal is to sit with each department head and try to figure out what, ex what specific metrics, I mean, metrics they would like to see, as well as what we need to see uniformly across the organization for a all HR functions. We've been able to do that. We uh, initially started with a position vacancy audit and we were able to do a data scrub and we're doing that in preparation for the uh, class and compensation study, which we discussed before and I can uh, discuss it a little bit more. But in terms of performing retrospective and discussing that for 2023, we're streamlining and uh, innovating dashboards across the organization for each individual department. Uh, improving human capital metrics pretty much the same thing, collecting and processing the data, making sure that the, uh, HR transactions are timely, uh, making sure that we're onboarding from the time that the application is made by candidates, that we're continuously moving it through the process and having fluid communications with our HR business partners and um, human resources, what I call central. And uh, the department, uh, I guess, representatives would be in terms of the uh, deputy commissioners and making sure they're in contact with the uh, different layers of the organization to keep that process moving. Offering competitive total rewards packages. One of the charges I received from this council was to make sure that when we go into the uh, next process for the RFP for uh, our benefits and open enrollment for this uh, fiscal year that we are making sure that the employees have a pretty much a robust opportunity to make a selection from different health plans. Uh, I have since hired a new uh, benefits director. Michael Naftaniel has joined our team, I think within the last two weeks. Correct. Yes, I'll introduce a few of the new team members. Uh, I think we rounded out the team with four or five new members. I have a new deputy commissioner of uh, compliance and regulation. I'll talk about that. Um, we have Michael Naftaniel who is going to be over benefits and uh, I'll talk about the others when I get there, but Michael's job right now, he is reviewing the, the last RFP process to make sure that, too close, I heard the P again. Uh, reviewing the last process to make sure that he understands exactly where the city's benefits plan is now and immediately said to me that he believes that with the number of employees that we have enrolled in our benefits plan that we can uh, leverage our, um, just on sheer numbers alone, the competitiveness and be able to compete uh, for uh, some better rates. So we're looking at that very closely and I um, will definitely entertain more questions around that when we get closer to that process. But we're working with um, procurement to do that right now. Reducing attrition. Um, we really wanna know why people leave the organization other than retirement. Um, are they happy? Are they well paid? Are they being treated fairly? So these are some of the assessments that we're making right now. And we're doing those assessments via labor management meetings. When I say labor management meetings, we are forging those partnerships. I met with the leadership of PACE, AFSME, and IAFF and had several meetings regarding various issues. The goal is to meet with them on a monthly basis so we don't end up with you know swelling arguments or challenges with the employees where it gets to a point where we have to deal with it too close <laughs> uh, making sure that we have ongoing discussions and relationship i think relationship is very important and it allows the employees to come in on a monthly basis or give that information to their leadership and we have and uh, we create the forum for them to have those discussions which has been very uh fruitful for us, especially when we uh, recently were able to uh, finalize the MOU. And with the MOU, we are going to institute MOU training so everyone knows exactly what it is, how it's supposed to be implemented, and what are the rules of engagement. So with that, um, I think that's new for the city as well. And grievance training has already taken place. I believe that's BT, before Tarly shared when I got here last year, I was told that the grievance training had already taken place. But we just wanna make sure that the employees have open and uh, uninterrupted access to human resources and know that we're available, we're here to help, and that we are going to do whatever we can to create an environment where they can work free without uh, 
a lot of the stress and things that the, were being complained of when I, I came on board. Uh, prioritizing employee mental health. Big, big, big one. Uh, employee mental health, especially coming out of the pandemic, is a hot topic uh, across the organization. And there are several initiatives that the uh, department has taken on in order to address that. There, you will see a few of them come forward in the next couple of months where we have buddy systems uh, for employees to be able to talk to uh, their, I guess their colleagues within their departments and touchdown spaces where and where they can uh, reach out directly to EAP uh, with some assistance and also teaching their coworkers how to identify issues um, with the employees to <laughs> identify issues of their coworkers uh, so that um, they can alert EAP or provide them with the proper support that they need. I'm not going to fight with this microphone today. <laughs> okay, let's get to it. Oh, it's up. Yay. So uh, also with um, the mental health component, we hopefully plan on standing up the first public safety behavioral health unit uh, with a, as a joint partnership between police and fire to provide mental health uh, assistance to our first responders. So that's coming to a uh, theater near you in the city. All right, you're keeping up with me, DC Nichols. OLER, Office of Labor and Employment Relations. Here we want to highlight the fact that um, this d division within HR was able to reduce the civil service case backlog from 69 down to seven. Uh, we had a backlog, as I understand it, as a result of the pandemic and not being able to convene the meetings. But I think we're on track right now to keep everything moving forward. And of that seven, uh, four of them uh, were either scheduled or waiting for the termination come over the next, within the next two months. I mentioned to you already that we're having the labor management meetings, which I think are integral to that process because we create the, um, the forum for employees to have uh, to share information and have the exchange and basically an, uh, an open and <laughs> this is ridiculous uh, in an environment where they can speak freely and I have probably had maybe 25 to 35 touchdown meetings with individual employees letting them know that they can access the human resources department for conflict resolution purposes. So between the department heads or commissioners and the employees and the labor units, we've been able to bring employees in to try to avoid any type of litigation or concerns that they have with uh, works, workplace concerns, issues, or challenges that they've had at their job or uh, with other employees. One of the other things I like to highlight here is that OLER has successfully partnered with OIG to assist with closing out more than 30 integrity line uh, ethics complaints, which is pretty big in a, uh, that time frame. And we have ongoing sexual harassment training with uh, APD. Benefits and pension. So I want to open this slide by saying I apologize. I remember <laughs> on, uh, well, la last month in December, I believe we had the wellness fair on the same day that we had a committee meeting and it was a bit disruptive. So uh, not understanding the scheduling process being new, we had it scheduled that day, but it was actually quite successful. So I pardon, I asked for forgiveness for the interruption and the disruption, but it was a great event. Um, and that was probably the third event that we had uh, in HR since I started in September. The first one was the open enrollment with the HR showcase, and I'll share the metrics with you from that. But the wellness event was basically an exposure of our wellness programs to the city to try to get as much saturation. I know that was one of the other charges from uh, this council to make sure that our employees are using the wellness, um, the wellness, what is it, the gym, the facility over there, as well as the, um, the, the clinic. So in working towards making employees more familiar with the services we had that expo and uh, pretty good attendance with that. Um, also along uh, employee benefits and pension, 
we are making a concerted effort to make sure that employees are aware of the benefits that they have. Uh, there was a question at one point whether or not our employees were um, signing up their beneficiaries and understanding all the benefits that were available to them uh, in their plan. So this year we did the HR showcase along with the open enrollment so that we had all the vendors available to answer questions for the employees. We had approximately 5,000 employees to come out, or I think it was like 4,800. The number, the metrics are uh, right behind the next two slides. But with that, I mean, I think it was great saturation for the organization in allowing the employees to access the actual vendor to get their questions answered and talk about how they can access the services. So we were able to do that as well. We will continue to make sure that employees, you know, throughout the year, not just at open enrollment, are um, educated about the benefits that they have and um, moving forward to track the metrics on how they're using it, uh, use accessing the health benefits plan. I've also spoken to Mr. Naftaniel, the benefits director, about trending um, the different claims history that we have to see what needs to be addressed in terms of uh, when we go into negotiations as well as seeing if we have any particular issues in any areas of the city for our um, employees. You're able to identify, say, just for example, if you have a certain work group where you get getting a lot of, um, and we're not speaking about anybody specific, but a particular work group that may have cancer claims coming out, we may want to take a look in that area or miscarriages or anything like that. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the claims history and the groupings or the trending uh, throughout the organization. Um, another part of that is simplifying the benefits communication. Many times we have employees who um, have the benefits and like, I don't know what that is or I'm not using that because, and that's another part of the education process. We have the benefits team will be dispatching out to the various units and various, um, I guess, agency, uh, not agencies, but departments within the organization to assist all of our employees and make sure that they understand the benefits packages that they have once they've enrolled. So Mr. Mr. Neftan, you're gonna be pretty busy over the next few months. Okay. And there are the metrics from the HR showcase there. And if you see the chart next to it, it gives you a breakdown day by day exactly how many touches we've had uh, during the weekend, during the open enrollment period. Organizational development and learning. Happy to report here that we have um, initiated um, a, a process where we are, again, checking the metrics for compliance training and all the other training that we're doing across the city. Um, our metrics are pretty good. They're gonna come up um, in the next couple of slides. But the mandatory uh, training that is, you will see over to the left-hand side there. Our numbers are pretty good uh, with the exception of two areas and it's because those are ongoing, but with the exception of those two areas, we have about 80% saturation of compliance training. We've been making it a point of uh, continuously notifying the departments and the employees that, you know, especially for something like cybersecurity uh, training or active shooter with the different challenges that we've seen, you know, mostly in the recent past, that this training is how the organization is going to teach us to respond to whatever we need to do here at the city of Atlanta. But our numbers are, they exceed 70 and 80% in all the areas with the exception of the ones that are ongoing. And I believe that is cybersecurity and I can, I'll know what the other one is when I have a couple more slides. Uh, beyond that, um, our ODL department is working towards automating a lot of the training. We still have quite a few uh, interactive trainings and we train on requests as the department requests uh, based on their needs. Uh, we're initiating some management training for the leaders because we've noticed that at mid-level, you know, when you transition from employee to manager, that's not always, you know, the best recipe for <laughs> leadership without some type of uh, background. So we're looking at doing that as well. And we also brought on the uh, new employee orientation training. You can see the numbers there, how many uh, employees have been onboarded and experienced it via the virtual experience. So that automation also um, allows us to get more done in a shorter period of time with fewer resources. I'm backing up, Chairman Wan. <laughs> I keep hearing the beat. 
those are the leader courses that I just spoke about, management and leadership moving forward. Uh, we also plan to uh, move forward. We're building a model right now with the mayor's office um, for professional development within the organization. The mayor will talk to you soon about that, but it's internal. It's great for the employees and a great morale booster, and it's going to clear up a lot of backlog in the city uh, in various departments. These are the numbers that we spoke of for the metrics for compliance training. And there you have the cybersecurity awareness where it's 35%. That training, I think the deadline is at the end of February, so we are pretty much on target to probably have similar numbers uh, if we're there. I thought I had another 30 number, but I guess we're pretty good. It was only one. <laughs> Am I missing something? Annual leave, carryover. Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah. We'll do better. <laughs> ah. Thank you, team. <laughs> Everybody's like, annual leave, annual leave. Okay. Yes, keep it moving. Okay, HRIS, uh, uh, Human Resources Information Systems. Name of the game here is streamline, dashboard, and be extremely efficient. Um, with Oracle Time and Labor coming on, we're just making sure that the information that we are purchasing uh, from Deloitte is going to be something that is user friendly and it's going to be operationally effective for us and we can get the proper data and metrics out of that. Um, I am a person who needs to see the numbers all the time in order for me to be able to inform the department uh, commissioners um, how we're moving forward from an HR perspective and just giving a snapshot of what the organization looks like at any given time, and I don't think that should be biannually or bimonthly. I think I should be able to do that on a daily basis. So we look at the numbers all the time, and right now, based on the position vacancy audit, the data scrub, and the different processes that we've um, undertaken uh, since I started in September, I think we have uh, a nice look, uh, picture of the numbers within the organization in terms of the number of employees and where they're seated and the work that they're performing, the transitions that we have and the transactions that we do on a daily basis. So to get that information real time or to be able to look at it uh, even at the end of the month is uh, gives us a pretty good picture of where we need to go and focus. I'm backing up Chairman Wan. Uh, where we need to focus in the organization um, in terms of recruiting, um, maybe looking at management issues. Uh, we, we're also instituting the exit interviews to make sure that we know why, if people are leaving, why they're leaving. Um, and if there's a management challenge there, I, I've scheduled some meetings with some of the commissioners to have those discussions about this work group is losing people at an alarming rate, what's happening over here. It can't just be the work. So we need to have a discussion about you know the challenges there, and we're doing that. But the metrics are the name of the game for us with HRIS and getting it in a user-friendly format that anybody in the organization can look at it and uh, make operational decisions. Okay, some good news, finally. Um, the city of Atlanta was named best and bright, one of the best and brightest companies to work for. We won that award. Uh, that's BT. I'm not taking credit for it. Thank you, Commissioner Norman and team. Um, but I wanted to highlight it because basically this is a random sampling of our employee workforce. It's done externally by a vendor and based on that, um, that survey that the employees complete and turn back in completely confidentially to this organization, they make a determination of who the winner is and we were actually able to do that. So hopefully uh, if I come back to you next time we can still be there and that means I haven't messed it up. <laughs> Okay, talent acquisition. More metrics. So, the worst thing that any employer can do is ask someone to come and apply for a job and not respond. Um, our goal is to make sure that that time frame is con as condensed as possible. You can see our metrics here. Um, we also have a new um, DC who is over talent acquisition, uh, Mr. Anthony Roberts. I'll in introduce the team at the end. Um, but that is the name of the game and also providing a vacancy report so we can see exactly when something is vacated, a position is vacated, how long it's going to take us to fill because we want to make sure that we don't have any operational efficiencies due to those vacancies. You scared me. <laughs> uh, 
um, with that um, and streamlining this process, making sure uh, I was just having a conversation with, um, I believe it was the fire department uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and we talk about how many touches we have in a process. We need to reduce the number of touches, that reduces the number of errors, and it uh, gives us more accountability when there's a challenge. So streamlining the process to get to these metrics is what we're doing. And uh, Ms. Finley, who's in charge of this department, uh, led the group, and we were able to hire nearly 3,000 employees last year. If you can see that number over there, it's 2836. But we also have some attrition with that. Hopefully all of it is retirement. We know it isn't, but we had some employee performance issues and other reasons why we um, separate employees. But I believe uh, the number of 3,000, well, 2836 is a good number in terms of actually being able to onboard employees. That's a lot of work um, that went into that. So. Thank you, Ms. Finley. More metrics. <laughs> this is by department. What you're looking at here is the actual number of hires by department. I know that we had some specific challenges that some of you um, spoke to directly in terms of uh, watershed, public works. I, I know police, uh, some departments that we're looking at very specifically to try to make sure that we close some gaps. Uh, public Works, we had a conversation with um, and meetings with uh, Commissioner Wiggins regarding their current uh, staffing and their upwards now of 85 to 90 percent. But with the fleet component, we are somewhere around 70 percent. I know that was one of the specific questions about what we're challenged with there, especially bringing on the new fleet of police vehicles that we're bringing on. Backing up again. Um, where we see challenges and where we have um, mission critical positions that are not, uh, that have vacancies that are not, um, that are operationally critical to the departments. We have considered hiring blitzes or spoken to the commissioners and partnered with procurement to see whether or not we need to augment with uh, a hiring agency, a sole source, or someone who can come in and stand in the gap until we fill those positions. A lot of the challenges that we have with either retention or recruitment in some of these specialty areas is with the compensation. So some of that we've actually had to go to administration and say, I need to do this now. It can't wait. Um, in fleet particularly, we are um, working in tandem with procurement to try to get um, some of those specialized skill sets from the technical uh, field for the mechanics to work um, and do some of the uh, I contract with them as well as recruit for some of those positions at the same time, because we're not just gonna step away from the HR space and say we're not recruiting, we're just gonna turn it over to the consultants. We're gonna work in tandem, we'll try to figure out exactly where they're farming out their um, talent from. So that's one of the um, initiatives we've instituted with Public Works to close their gap. And with Watershed, I believe that we had a hiring blitz back in December where we had over 540 participants. And since that time, we've hired at least 20 of those people, and many of the um, interviews are still in progress to continue to onboard over there. Which other department has critical? We're uh, off, Office of um, uh, Department of Planning. We, I, I mentioned to you earlier what we did there in terms of being able to deal with the backlog. We're doing some internal training there. I believe uh, the planning Commissioner spoke to some of that yesterday or has mentioned it to you all regarding uh, some of the internal employees there being trained at a level where they can process, I should say, train and process, be able to process some of the, the backlog that's there for the affordable housing program and some of the other critical development projects that we have out there. So we've kind of augmented those teams by breaking it up. I believe uh, there are 12 employees there and created an advanced issues team. We worked over the last week and they will be working on um, on the weekends uh, to reduce the backlog. So that, that's gonna help a, a lot in the planning space. I spoke to the Blitz over in DWM and beyond that space, I believe we don't have any other departments that have mission critical vacancies that haven't been addressed by human resources. Okay, talent acquisition career fairs. 
We have had several. Uh, the one that I just mentioned to you was the one with the watershed management 540, but you can see here that um, the department is busy with external career fairs um, throughout the year. We are looking at um, recruitment and retention strategies kind of differently, um, taking a different approach because the talent pool right now, as we know since the pandemic, many people just, I want to work from home and the demand is great for teleworking. So we have to get a little um, creative in how we approach that space. So we've been working with um, not working with our internal group, some consultants, having conversations with universities about what we can do to improve our relationship with the public in trying to, in trying to entice candidates to come. And we also, most importantly, want to build working relationships with our employees because they're the ones who tell people, you want to work here, you don't want to work here, don't come here, I don't like my boss, I hate this, I hate that. You know, um, so that's to me, um, our biggest champion, if we keep our employees happy and they, well, everybody's not going to be happy, but if we create an environment where people wake up and they don't have certain things to say about work before they get here, um, that, that's the goal, to make sure that we are uh, creating an, an environment where people want to come to work and they don't mind sharing with someone, yeah, you should apply, or, you know, instead of don't come here, are you all hiring wherever you wherever you are. So that, that is some of um, what we're talking about. And even with the police department, um, our approach to recruiting police officers is speaking about policing as a profession rather than coming to a career fair, filling out an application and saying, you know, how much money we're paying or you get a car or whatever it is. We want to talk about professional policing in the city of Atlanta. So that's one some of the discussions we're having right now with Mr. Amen and Chief Shearbaum about how we're moving forward with recruitment for police. Okay, EAP. We have had, that's another charge that I received from this council when I started, is increasing the saturation or the number of touches or the access to uh, our services for the employees. And I'm happy to report that uh, there, there has been an increase in the utilization rate of about 25%. We've been marketing it a bit more. We had the expo, we were having conversations. We brought out the in-body machine um, and through open enrollment and their ongoing initiatives and there are a few challenges that are coming up. So we're trying to do as much as we can to engage the employees and let them know that we're available and that these services are available to them. Uh, EAP is open to each and every employee in the city. Um, it's confidential services that are provided to the employees and their families um, as needed. And uh, we have a great uh, team leading that effort under uh, Dr. Smith, who will also be working with uh, Mr. Nathaniel, the benefits manager, as we discussed earlier. So these are some of the initiatives that we were speaking about um, earlier. Everybody has a cell phone, so now we're into QR codes and reaching out to staff uh, that way. Um, and establishing the, um, the state-of-the-art training facility is going to be um, most important. I think one of the other things I, I, I think is a, a great idea that we are embarking upon is the public safety, back up Tarlisha, the public safety behavioral health unit, um, especially coming out of the pandemic and moving into some of the challenges like what we uh, witnessed last week, having that uh, mental health um, support and awareness for our first responders and, and other staff who have to see some of the things that are happening about the city and about the nation, just having our staff at the ready to be able to assist. And uh, we're working on, I want to say, some staff changes there in order to address specific public safety um, issues and be at the ready when uh, Chief Shearbaum or Chief um, Smith make the call for us to come out. More metrics. <laughs> Vaccine status. I think there's a COVID report, so I can scoot over this, right? Today? That's a high number. 81% uh, fully vaccinated, self-reported, self-certified. That's not seen that in any other organization or heard of it anywhere else, but that's BT. It's great, and I'm glad to hear it, and I'm sure that will continue. 
uh, Felipe and his group have done an excellent job uh, with moving that forward. Uh, some of the other metrics that are there, um, of course, the 2837 in terms of the number of employees hired. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't have to get rid of that little caricature. <laughs> Professional development. Uh, we spoke to that earlier. I'm actually going to read this one because I wrote it and I think it's very important. Citywide professional development endeavors to bridge the gaps in hard and soft employment skills for our valued workforce. The ultimate goal is to create measurable and clearly visible financial and educational outcomes for a growing workforce in our post pandemic environment. In keeping with the mayor's Move Atlanta Forward initiatives, the city's investment in the newly upskilled citywide professional development advances the level of service delivery to our citizens in various communities of interest, while simultaneously creating opportunities for upward mobility for employees citywide. Finally, investment in closing skills gaps for employees leads to better community relations and reinvigorates public trust in government. I wanted to read that because um, in human resources, it's been our goal to make sure that before we look for outside talent, we look inside and give those employees, I mean, you have employees who've been in the same positions for many years, giving them the opportunity internally first to be trained by their supervisors and those who are the SMEs within their departments and giving an opportunity if they're open to it uh, to advance themselves. But we want to launch that, you know, from an internal space and HR is leading that effort uh, in partnership with a couple of other departments. So that's being piloted and coming soon. Next, LGBTQ Consortium. This group um, will allow employees in each department to have a touchdown space with a liaison who communicates with Mr. Malik's office. I can't remember the name of his office. LGBTQ Affairs, maybe? Did I make it up? I got it right? Okay, yes, in conjunction with his, part, his department or partnership with his department to have a liaison within each department of the city to have difficult conversations or even share ideas uh, at some point and bring that forward or even participate in community events. But there's been some communication with my office via various employees and about concerns that they've had or that they've personally dealt with and that's what this um, consortium is how this consortium was developed so that's coming soon we will be sending out the information to each individual department and serving uh, our workforce to see who wants to actually participate and be a liaison and a part of that work group that will meet probably bi-monthly backing up Creating compliance. Uh, this is one of, to me, the most important things that um, we're doing in HR in terms of uh, cleanup uh, for, or I guess innovation for the department. We created um, the Compliance and Regulation Division and Human Resources to be able to uh, track, train, monitor, oversee all things legal and regulatory as it relates to human resources. Because as I see human resources, there are a lot of laws that are associated with the discipline. And many times, if you don't have proper policies, you're not monitoring it. And a lot of our policies and procedures track state law or federal law just to keep abreast of that and keep our staff trained. And beyond being trained and knowing what to do, how to do it, because interactions with our employees aren't always the greatest. Um, and when we don't do that, we have exposure for the city. So the whole goal of that compliance division is to make sure that we're not only compliant in paper, but compliant in our actions toward our workforce uh, and labor and management relations. And that is one of the reasons why we're gonna move forward and continue with the labor management uh, meetings on a monthly basis, uh, not just for training and you know employee platforms to have a discussion, but also for us to cultivate ideas about what works for the city and to find out what's happening in the various departments with their employees. So this, this division will be headed up by Ms. Candace Colas, an attorney um, who actually used to work for our law department is now uh, over this area. So uh, she's an experienced litigator 
in employment law and a, a former consultant. I hope former. All right, Candace, say yes. Yes. Oh, yes, she said yes. All right, I don't speak for the mayor, so those are his pillars. We follow them and we keep it moving. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I would say, Commissioner, you can exhale now. You did great. That was a, a great Mike. presentation. Um, Thank you. All right, colleagues, uh, if you have any questions or comments or feedback for the Commissioner, I'll go ahead and get in the line up the queue. First up is Howard Shook. Yeah, thank you. And I recognize and appreciate um, your efforts. Good report. Thank you. And the report just kind of touches on, but I know you're, I know there's a lot more beneath that. I have a request. Um, you have the opportunity to do something that your predecessors did not do, which is uh, provide me with the annual information I asked for um, in terms of where the various employees fall out. Across, and your, your staffers, they know, they know what that is. The sick so, report. If you could get that to me, that'd be great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Done. All right, uh, Council Member Hillis. Chairman Juan, thank you, Commissioner, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, you touched <clears throat> a bit on EAP, and um, back before your tenure here, that was one of the main issues I was approached about uh, from the rank and file of APD and AFRD being Chair of Public Safety. Um, so I see the plan here, but what does EAP look like right now as far as staffing, and what... Um, changes have you made since uh, being in this position? Uh, part of it is hiring the benefits director. Uh, we have the wellness director. I do I have the org now to tell you exactly what the personnel complement is, but we do have um, one, two, three, I believe three psychologists. How many? Three. Three. I think it's three. Three psychologists and they have support personnel to work with them. They do on call. Um, they do call outs. They work with the departments, specifically um, the commissioners. What, are you speaking to public safety specifically or in well, general? Just overall, the and then, you know, there were some conversations. So give me an overall look at it. And then there were some conversations previously about, you know, given the, you know, not saying everyone in the city's job is stressful at times, but, you know, our frontline public safety firemen, uh, police yeah, officers. Responders. You know, there's certainly a, a high stress level there and there was some talk about getting them their own assigned um, team and that's what we were speaking to the public safety behave, behavioral health unit um, we don't really like to call it mental health wellness because people shy away from that so it's a behavioral health unit and that's where they can access that um, that skill set that group that support group because they are going to be specifically assigned to fire and specifically assigned to police to address their issues. And we also have the rest of the team. There are other psychologists who are there to service the rest of the city. So with that, um, we're standing it up. I believe um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Moore are point right now. I'm not really sure who the third psychologist is. I can't remember her name right now. But we have uh, three of them and uh, we're shuffling right now. The new benefits director has just come in. That unit's going to be stood up in the next few months. Um, we're working on the funding model and the actual organizational chart and everything right now to make sure it has a proper administrative support uh, to do that because, you know, for instance, when we have incidents like we had last week, we want to make sure that we have EAP at the ready to address any issues or any trauma that the first responders experience right at that time. To, so we have to make sure that we have correct staffing levels available to them. But right now they're on call when they need to be and in preparation normally if we find out that, you know, something may be imminent, we have them at the ready to be able to dispatch. And do you feel three psychologists is sufficient for EAP or is there are there open positions? Are there plan? If there are, are there plans to fill those? Or for right now, I believe so because we want to just uh, stand up the unit and make sure that we understand how it's going to operate and interact with the personnel. As we see it moving forward, I think we could probably touch it again, maybe in six months, to see how it's doing, and see what the staffing level or um, st staffing component needs to be at that time. The personnel complement. But right now, I believe we are pretty good. All right. Thank, Thank you, and I'll leave you with a request. I uh, would like to uh, see the, uh, an updated org chart for HR, please. For human resources? Yes. 
Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else before I jump into my questions? Um, Okay, I, I appreciate the really comprehensive look and explanation in detail about how you're approaching your, with your team and kind of the different. I think for me for this year, as we kind of walk the walk together, um, I think first and foremost is, is really looking at um, our staffing levels and the vacancies and, and our inability or ability to be able to fill vacant positions. Um, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I think we, we are navigating a very fine balance between um, asking those that are here to deliver um, above and beyond what their normal job capacity should be because of the vacancies. Um, I also think that we've, we've got to be very mindful about, you know, how many of the vacancies are really just going to be structurally the way things are going forward, um, that we really are not going to be able to fill those or, um, at, you know, at what point do we say, we got we got to find another strategy or another um, method, and and it may be you touched on this also. It may just be supplementing or replacing, supplanting or complementing with contract mm -hmm. arrangements with other folks. But at some point, we're going to have to make a decision. I mean, I think we're far enough out from the pandemic that we can't really attribute it to that anymore. Um, sure. And if we need to relook at what our model, our business model is going forward, um, this may be the time to do it. Uh, that will ha have to do with the pay in class study and, and remind me again the timetable um, on that. Um, actually, we just had a meeting in December with the vendor and finalized the contract. So we're um, actually scheduled to meet with them next week. W what we had to do was ready ourselves for that. I, I know I came before you and mentioned that we were doing the position vacancy count or whatever. We want to have our, our data and everything in order and also know how they're going to dispatch once they get here, have our staff at the ready to receive them. So within this first quarter, we're going to initiate um, the, the class and comp study. Um, yeah, I think that one's going to lag a little bit between maybe when a time when we're going to need to make some decisions or at least really explore, like I said, flipping some business models, operation models. And it's going to be different from department to department, but I, I trust that y'all will uh, take a good look at that. Um, I think the other piece, too, is uh, the telework um, policies. I think I know that I'm hearing a lot about um, just the challenges with constituents trying to get in touch with the appropriate people at various departments. Um, to be able to get keep certain processes moving along, uh, example is permits. Um, so I, I think we, yeah, I j encourage you to take a, a look at that and, and really assess and evaluate with, with all the department heads in terms of what's appropriate, what's not, because um, we just got to get the ball Rolling. the ball moving on the field. <laughs> yes. And sometimes some positions are conducive to a telework model; others aren't, and I think we just have to be realistic about that. Uh, in terms of, oh yeah, uh, we, um, I've got the other problem where I'm too far away from the microphone. <laughs> Between the two of us, we're going to be great. Uh, we'll average out fine. Um, but yeah, I think we just, you know, uh, just continue to look at that because at the end of the day, service level delivery is what, what we got to focus on and if whatever adjustments we need to make along the way, um, we should. The last piece uh, that I'm going to be focusing on this year is pension and OPEB, um, the um, post-employment benefits. I think it's high time we kind of revisit that uh, yes. in terms of, you know, the adjustments we made over a decade ago. Are they, you know, have they taken effect? Do we need to make any further adjustments? Um, and so um, let's just you and I not take our eye off of that ball in terms of, you know, we focus a lot on just compensation in general, sure. but we also know that our, our staff um, rely on and it is a way of uh, our being able to recruit and retain folks as well. Um, so I'll just put that on your radar. Okay. For, Absolutely. Uh, um, other comments or questions from my colleagues? All right. Yeah, Ms. Overstreet. So it's almost budget season. So this is a good time to be having these conversations. So uh, thank you, uh, Chair Juan, for pointing that out. You know, be bold and clear okay. uh, because budget season is coming up, and we really do want to make sure that we have the right people in the right positions and the right number. Um, and, and we're willing to um, explore whatever your vision is. Thank you. We're, we're working already in tandem with um, CFO Bala's office regarding that and division uh, departmental 
business plans with staffing models that um, help us drive that. So definitely, thank you. We, we will definitely be on top of that. All right, uh, if there are no further questions, all right, I've just got, colleagues, I've gotten a request from the administration to move the Department of Labor paper up, oh, after the presentations, okay, um, sorry. Um, so congratulations on your first presentation. <laughs> thank you. And we'll see you next quarter. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right, next up is uh, Mr. Deloach with um, Finance Department to talk about the COVID-19 funds report. And colleagues, you have a copy of that that's been sent out in, in our packet. Good Linda, can we, there's a, the substitute for the uh, HelloFresh paper. Can we get copies of that for everybody? Do you mind? I know it's in the packet, but let's get some hard copies of that in advance. It, they, you know, like that. Okay. All right, Mr. Deloach, yeah. you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry L. Deloach, Chief Risk Officer for the City of Atlanta, out of the Department of Finance, and I will present the January 2023 CFO report on COVID-19. Uh, basically, what I'll do is go through the setup of the report, I won't call out the exact numbers for each category, but I'll make sure that the committee understands how the report is set up and how it will be going on an uh, ongoing basis in the following months. Uh, on slide two, it is just the reporting requirements, the legislation which authorizes us to make a report to the council and to the office of the mayor. Okay. Uh, slide three, it shows a, an overview of all of the funds that we have received for COVID-19. It also has columns which show the budgeted amount and the actual cost against each one of those particular grants that we have been awarded. And it shows the uncommitted amount. And if you'll go down to the bottom, you'll see on this particular slide here, which is for all of the federal funds, it will show you going over to page four, uh, the amount that remains of uncommitted uh, funds. What that means is that the funds have been allocated to particular programs they just have not had any expenses to be charged against them it does not mean that we have 75 million dollars available to spend it just means that we're waiting for those invoices and those payments requests to come in the next slide which is slide five it starts to break down of each individual grant that we have been awarded funds for uh, the first one up is crf and that is more commonly known as the cares fund you will see that it breaks down in terms of, uh, we call them tasks, but those are actual projects or programs that have been funded. You'll see the office that was funded uh, through in the internal office that is the uh, internal manager for that particular program. It shows the budgeted amount, the obligated cost against that, and it also shows you what the remaining balance is. Uh, if you're looking at the top of the page, it would give you the breakdown of the original amount that we received, how we've obligated the cost, how we've had actual costs of what the available balance is. And each following slide will also tell you what is the uh, obligation period, meaning the time period we have to spend the funds. And then it will tell you the time period that we have to provide the final expenditure report to uh, the federal government. Uh, for this particular program, CARES, it is closed out completely. There are no funds remaining available to be spent for this particular program. If you go to the next slide, which is slide six, it is the breakdown for ERA, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, it will show you that we received a total of $49 million uh, for ERA allocation. That includes both ERA-1, uh, ERA-1 reallocated, as well as uh, uh, funds for ERA-2. Uh, it is showing that we have had actual costs of $36,520,000, and we have a budgeted balance of $11 million. For this particular program, uh, the 21 million, we are in a position where we will be returning monies back to the federal government. Uh, we will report back later on that when we close out that program completely. But right now, the time period of spending those funds has elapsed and passed, and we will be doing a final closeout report to the council. Next up is ARPA Tranche 1, which is the Rescue, American Rescue Plan Act. We had 85, this is tranche one only, we had 85 million uh, awarded to us. We have committed, meaning allocated and budgeted spending for that. If you look down the left-hand column, it will show you the, the various programs and various projects that we are sponsoring with those funds. And it will also show you which department is the internal manager for those funds. And if you look down at the bottom, 
is showing uh, a remaining balance of two million. That means out of the 84 million, we have only 2.9 million left. Once again, it does not mean that it has not been allocated. We're still waiting on expenses to come in against that 2.9 million. The next slide on page eight is ARAP, ARPA tranche two. Uh, once again, we received 85.4 million. We have committed 85.4 million. And right now we're only showing 16.77 million for uh, obligated costs. And then we have direct payments of 27.3 million for total expended right now, as we speak today, uh, 35.6 million. The deadline for spending these funds from ARPA tranche two excuse me, ARPA in general, is December 31st of 2024. The next series of grants that I'll go through are from the uh, Department of Aviation. Uh, it shows, once again, the amount of funds that were obligated. There's a breakdown which shows how those funds thus far have been expended, and it shows what the available balance is on this particular one. It's about 24000 that's left, and they have to spend those funds. Uh, they, have, they, have, they have the capacity to spend those funds for April 26th of 2024, but they have done a great job of spending those funds thus far. Uh, next one is a breakdown also from DOA. Uh, this is the concessions grant. Uh, the performance period is March 24, 2021 through March 23rd of 2025. As you can see from this grant, they have already uh, spent and obligated and have actual costs for the full amount of this particular grant. Third grant is from DOA, another ARPA uh, grant, uh, obligated cost of 324. Uh, the performance period is from November of 2021 through November of 2025, and they have an available balance of 274 uh, out of the Department of Aviation. The next one is another grant from the Department of Aviation. It was funded for $45.8 million, um, and they're showing that they have spent those actual costs and their available balance for that. And it's also showing what the performance period for that time period for this particular grant is as well. The next series of grants, they are from the, they are grants that are managed by the Departments of Grants and Community Development. Uh, this particular grant is the Emergency Solution Grant. Uh, you can see what the performance period is through July of 2027, and they have an available balance of 2.6 million out of 12.7 that they were awarded. Next grant is also from the Department of Community Development, Grants and Community Development. Uh, it was the Community Development Block Grant uh, associated with COVID-19. The funded amount was $4.2 million. Uh, they have a performance period through July of 2027, and they currently have an available balance of $399,000. The next grant is another grant managed by Grants and Community Development, Harper Grant. Uh, funded amount was $3.3 million. They have obligated costs of 800.6 million, no, excuse 800.6,000, .6, have actual costs of 800.6,000, they have an available balance of 2.5, and their performance period is through July 2027, so they still have some time to spend on that. Uh, the next grant is with the Atlanta Police Department uh, to respond to COVID-19. The original uh, awarded amount was 1.38 million. Uh, they have obligated costs and actual costs of 1.1, and they have an available balance of $260,000, and we will work on getting you a performance period for that particular grant. Uh, the next grant is the First Responders Grant. Uh, this was a grant that was awarded to the city of Atlanta uh, from the state of Georgia to provide a, excuse me, to provide a supplemental pay uh, to public safety, which included both corrections, police, and fire, uh, all of the active employees who are with the city of Atlanta and those who are eligible at the time but are no longer with the city, they have been awarded those funds based on the amount uh, that the state sent us. Uh, page 18, it is a breakdown of funds that we use to support nonprofit philanthropic organizations. Uh, there has been no change in that since about uh, the beginning of fiscal year 22. Uh, page 19 is a summary of donations that have been received by the city of Atlanta uh, this will cover year, fiscal years 20, 21, and 22. Uh, those funds, uh, donations cease to come to the city in FY22, and so that's why we have not included FY23 in there. Uh, pages 20 through 21 is a breakdown 
of detailed information as required by the legislation that this information is used by audit to check for, for a, excuse me, used by ethics to check for a conflict of interest. Okay. One of the things that we're required to do is provide to the council a breakdown of all grants as well as the expenses that have been charged against them to show that we are in balance in terms of funds that we have available and the expenses that are charged against those funds. Uh, if you're looking, uh, I'll call it the, the second big block for budgeted expenditures, it will show the breakdown for our total budget for FY20, 21, 22, and 23, and it will show the total of those expenditures. You'll also, if you'll go over to the far right where it shows funding, it will show how each one of the grants that I talked about earlier, CARES, the Emergency Rental Assistance, the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, grants from the state, uh, FEMA, which we are currently seeking uh, reimbursement for for some of our expenses, and it will also show you funds that have been used, funds used by the city that were city funds that were met, used to meet COVID-19 expenses. And if you go down to the very bottom, it will show that we have had expenditures of approximately 283 million and we have revenue or uh, grants that total 283 million to balance that out. And that's our report for, Ju for uh, January. All right. <laughs> Questions for Mr. Deloach. Uh, I'm going to jump in first then. I think there was some shuffling going around with some distributions of papers. Did I hear you correctly that there were some emergency rental funds that we're going to end up sending back? That's correct. Uh, what, was, what was the balance on that and the reason? That's, it's about $10 million that we're going to send back. Uh, that was from the ERA-1 reallocated. Received a total of about $21 million for that. Uh, we've done it. We did everything we possibly could to make sure that all available um, people who applied receive those funds, and we made sure that they maximized out on the amount that they were eligible to receive, whether it be a dollar amount or whether or not, they were obligated, whether or not we were limited to providing them with like three months or four months rents, but we made sure we met that obligation for people who were eligible. Okay. And as the program uh, continued from the beginning of COVID-19 to where we are now, um, the level of interest or the level of need decreased somewhat. So we'll provide a full report on that once we close out the program. So you'll see the total number of people we serve, uh, how many applied, that type of information. And, okay. um, Council members, also good to note, it should be noted here that this is ERA-1 reallocation funding that came from the state to the city because the state had had a hard time allocating those funds. So we, I think it was uh, in better hands and we put utilization to it and got $11 million out the door. So it's a testament to the city. All that money could have went back to the feds. So we were able to help out a lot of people out. Thank you for that clarification. The other question I had was, so um, if I were to try and look at this and determine how much ARPA funding we have left, because I know that if, in the last couple of cycles we've allocated some funding to some programs out of that. Um, I can't remember. It, it escapes me exactly what. Um, how would I go about doing that? Because I think we asked that question during the last Finance Executive Committee meeting. I don't know if it was for Forest Cove or if it was another initiative, but if you go, if you go to page five and page six, uh, page five is ARP. No, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Page seven and page eight. Page seven is ARP A tranche one, and if you look at the programs to the left, going down the column, it will show you the programs that are currently being funded by tranche one, and it will show gotcha. you the breakdown of what's been budgeted. And then if you look in total cost, it will show you how they're spending against that total cost. So if I'm reading page eight correctly, we still have $41 million in ARPA funding that could get allocated. Is that correct? Um, I'm, I'm, which page are you on? Because I don't see Page eight. I'm seeing, uh, That's, well, tranche oh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, on the far right. It's showing the remaining balance, but that does not mean that the remaining balance is available. Those funds have been allocated, but we have not seen the expenses to start coming in against those particular programs. That's why you're seeing a balance there. We're currently developing the scope of work in order to allow them to move forward, executing the contract, uh, obtaining the purchase order for them to spend that $41 million. Those right. are programs in progress that we're waiting on them to. Okay, so I guess um, then how can we be helpful in terms of the example I was using earlier, like Forest Cove, or there were some other initiatives that we... Now, Forest Cove was funded for an additional 7.5. Right. Yeah. So yeah. looking at this, then, what I'm, I guess what I'm hearing is I can't tell how much is non-committed, that, so that if 
we had, um, rather than risk having to send funds back, yeah. that we could start helping hunt for um, causes or initiatives that qualify for the program um, funding source. Okay, and I, I answer your question this way. Okay, um, I, I meet um, weekly with um, representatives from the mayor's office, including LaShondra Burks, and we go over where we are on spending. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, as these programs are being developed, we're telling them the time period that we would like to see them spend the funds. And right now, we're using um, June 30th of 2024. Uh, if over the course of the time period from now to June 30th, if there is a, uh, a slow spend rate, we will address that issue at that time in order to give us sufficient time between June, uh, July 1 of 2024 and December 31st to reallocate programs. So we do a check-in on a weekly basis okay. uh, to make sure that they're spending. And if for some reason they cannot, uh, if they're drafting a scope of work that's not eligible, We'll let them know and give them an opportunity to redraft their scope of work. And so we're constantly monitoring it. So the only reason that happened with ERA is because the level of interest uh, decreased. Sure, I, mean, I get that, that. So basically, you and Ms. Burks, I'll tell you, if you walk down the halls, there's no shortage of ideas of how to spend money. And just not, we don't know how to source it, quite <laughs> frankly. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, all good initiatives, but, but it seems to me if we've got these funds and, and the ARPA funds, seem to have a lot of flexibility, but also some very specific things that sound like they match up with some of the ideas that folks have. It's you and Ms. Burks to, to... And then there's a representative from some of the programs being managed by the Chief of Staff's office. So there's regular communication gotcha. to make sure that their scope of work is being submitted, is being reviewed. If there are any issues to work out with that, then we have plenty of time to work it out. If they can't work it out, then that creates an opportunity for refunding, not refunding, but reprogramming. But at this time, okay. there's nothing to reprogram, but we, we, we meet regularly. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's the one committee member that isn't here today that I think would be very excited to hear there might be some funding, okay. funds available for different things. So okay. um, we'll be sure to pass that message along to her. Okay. Other questions or comments from Mr. Deloach? All right, thank you. And thank just you. colleagues, from this point on, I just wanted to do this as an in-person presentation for the first meeting of, of the year. The rest of the pre, uh, COVID funds reports will be done electronically unless we have specific questions that we want to have Mr. Deloach come report to us about. Okay, that takes care of our presentations. Um, and uh, per, like I said earlier, the, um, Mr. Pace has requested that uh, um, we move up the Department of Labor paper. Is the Chief of Staff here? Let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and signal that we're gonna do it and have him come over if he's the one presenting. And then in the meantime, let's go ahead and get the first reads read in um, to buy us a little bit of time. Yes, well, Mr. Linda. Chair. Um, item number one is 230-1062. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee to authorize the city on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to accept the donation of funds to the Public Art Trust valued at $115 to support the Public Art Trust for art conservation. The donation to be deposited into the Public Trust account numbers listed herein. And for other purposes, item number two is 230-1063. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation to pay all outstanding invoices to Precision 2000 Inc. for the job number listed herein. Uh, the Glenwood Avenue, Moreland Avenue Intersection Improvement Project in an amount not to exceed $138,852.57. All invoices to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. All right, so those have now been sounded. We will uh, address those during the next committee cycle. And I see the Chief of Staff here. I'm going to go ahead and read in item 23-01056. This is an ordinance by Council Members Lewis, Bond, Westmoreland, Waits, Winston, Faroki, Amos, Dozier, Bakhtiari, Juan, Shook, Norwood, Hillis, Boone, and Collier Overstreet is substituted by Community Development and Human Services Committee, an ordinance to establish the City of Atlanta Department of Labor and Employment Services to amend Chapter 2, Article 2, Division 3, Subdivision 1, Section 2-135D, to provide that the committee on Community Development and Human Services shall have jurisdiction over the Department of Labor and Employment Services to amend Chapter 2, Article 5, Section 2-222 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to add the Department of Labor and Employment Services to the organization of the Executive Branch to amend Chapter 2, Article 5, Section 2-227 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to provide for the functions and duties of the Department of Labor and Employment Services 
to authorize the chief financial officer to create the appropriate department organi uh, organization and accounts to anticipate and appropriate the necessary funding in connection with the creation of the Department of Labor and Employment Services to authorize the chief financial officer and the commissioner of the Department of Human Resources to transfer any positions currently assigned to any office or department operating under the executive branch to the Department of Labor and uh, Employment Services and for other purposes. Colleagues, this was substituted, I believe, in uh, CDHS to insert department organization numbers and to insert the ordained clause and the substitute is now before us. Mr. Donald, you have the floor. Absolutely. Well, listen, Chairman, thank you first for uh, allowing us to uh, come before you today and talk about this new uh, proposed department. I'll just kind of hop by, right in by saying I think all of you are very familiar with the mayor's commitment to workforce development, uh, labor and employment relations, and really just the betterment of our staff making us a model workplace. This will have uh, both internal and external benefits. Uh, this office consists of bringing WorkSource Atlanta uh, back basically fully under the house uh, and making it a division of the new Department of Labor and Employment Services. Also uh, has an office that is focused on labor relations and uh, really innovation in how we coordinate. Uh, and the first employee, Ms. Humetta Embry, was one of the first announced by the mayor. Uh, she would lead a three-person office. Uh, our new commissioner, uh, Commissioner Smith, has been very instrumental in us framing and uh, identifying the different areas of this department. And so two positions, I know it mentions uh, as many positions as are needed or that technical language. There are only two positions. Um, those have been vacant in HR for a while. She's fortified her staff and uh, provided us those two roles that would come over. Uh, and then the balance of it would be adding some ARPA funding as well as some uh, funding from the Gulch uh, uh, settlement that would go in for workforce development. So those funds have already been earmarked at about $4 million. So uh, the $3.2 million that is associated with WorkSource Atlanta would also help fund this department for a first year amount of about $9.4 million. Uh, that would include the mayor's summer youth employment program as well. So give you a high level overview of those activities and answer any questions uh, that you have that may remain. All right, questions from Mr. Donald. Um, so it's my understanding that this actually would not take effect until July 1 of 2020. That is correct, right. yes sir. Currently we're doing uh, some searches and uh, some kind of pre-hiring for those key positions like the commissioner, uh, but outside of that and, and some of the required things for the summer youth employment program, we would officially begin July 1. Because okay. um, some of the questions I would want to see, I mean, obviously org chart, uh, org structure, um, I, I, we will now, it'll just be folded up into the budget process so we'll have a Department of Labor presentation during that um, that would explain. That's exactly role. right. Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely. Um, other questions for Mr. Donald on this? Motion from Winston to approve on substitute, seconded by Shook. Sorry, Let's open the vote on that, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, and motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Thank you, Mr. Donald. All right, let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming, uh, the regular agenda. First item is ordinances for second reading, 23-01016. Uh, All right, this is an ordinance by Council Member Matt Westmoreland as substituted by Finance Executive Committee and as substituted by the Atlanta City Council to amend Chapter 2, Article 3, Division 1, Section 2-190C to create the organizational structure within the executive office of the mayor to provide for the executive and administrative staff to support the chief policy officer in order to ensure the efficient and effective development of the policy agenda and initiatives of the mayor to authorize the chief financial officer to create the appropriate organizational numbers to transfer or otherwise allocate appropriate funding to provide for the executive and administrative staff to support the chief policy officer to authorize the Chief Financial Officer and the Commissioner of the Department of Human Resources to transfer any positions currently assigned to any office or department operating under the Executive Branch to the Executive Office of the Mayor as shall be necessary to provide for the Executive and Administrative Staff to support the Chief Policy Officer and for other purposes. Um, the College will, will recall this was referred back to committee um, uh, at full council. Um, I see Mr. English. Mr. English, I, 
don't know if you want to make some uh, comments um, before we dive into deliberation. No, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this paper is coming back before you uh, on substitute. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have. What we've essentially tried to do is streamline it uh, in order to mirror uh, the office of uh, the chief operating officer, the office of uh, the chief of staff. And so that's what this paper is attempting to accomplish. So happy to answer any specific questions you may have. All right, questions for Mr. English. I will. All right, there's a motion from uh, Westmoreland to approve. I'll go ahead and take a second on that, second. but second from Winston. I do have a couple of questions. So I, we talked about this on uh, last Tuesday about it marrying up with the personnel paper, which we have the substitute now. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that at the end when we pull up held papers. So there are some actions in here that essentially are moving some folks um, under or into your the office of chief the chief policy officer correct that is correct and also uh, I believe this changes your role from senior policy advisor into the chief policy it creates that um, and, and moves you into that position chief policy officer already exists it already what did. It, it, it's already okay. in the code what it does what the personnel Perfect. paper will do specifically is actually change uh, the job grade of the chief policy officer to, to match uh, my current uh, job grade and so uh, yeah. okay that's helpful um, and the, there was some other questions that were raised regarding your, the organization chart that you provided last um, the finance committee um, is kind of just the starting point, right? I mean, you only had kind of the, the head positions of each. There was like five initiatives. I, I should have brought that in with me. Does the personnel paper move other folks as well? It does. Okay. It does. And so this office, aside from those, um, was it five or six kind of initiative? Five. Five. How many other additional people does it move in? So it moves, it moves six additional people um, from one department into this office, and then it codifies um, some folks who are moving from the office of the chief of staff into this office. And so okay. there are five people moving from, I'm sorry, seven people total moving from a department. And then there are one, two, uh, two individuals moving from um, the office of the chief of staff into this office. So it's a total of nine people, including, uh, in addition to yourself in the, on your team now? That is correct. Well, the total, there's, then there, we get into like, there's my EA and, and, and a few other folks. But the total is, I believe, Commissioner, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is I think we counted at 15 folks or so. 15. Okay. Um, and then everyone just kind of, aside from your direct team, the rest just kind of fold within the, the five person structure. That's correct. Okay, and all, all of that is contemplated in the personnel paper. It is. All right, the second question, uh, the third question I have is there, there was also some conversation about um, the folks that you are moving in, what, what that means, the implications for the departments from which they're being transferred. So two questions on that. Number one, the position that they, the person um, currently holds does that position remain and does that essentially become a vacancy that will need to be filled? Um, and then, well, I'll, I'll start with that question. I have a follow-on question. So the, so for the position of, say, the director of youth will become the policy advisor on education, that, that entire function comes over okay. uh, to the office as well as uh, the partnerships person as well. Um, the other people are are new with the one exception. I believe you're asking about the housing uh, folks mainly. And so what we are endeavoring to do is essentially move pe move the policy framework out of housing into a policy office, leave um, the planning commissioner uh, space flexibility and funded <coughs> positions to hire and staff up as uh, she and the commissioner of HR uh, and of course uh, the COOC fit, knowing that there are some deficiencies within the planning department. Yeah, I think that was the concern ra raised was just, you know, as you're moving folks in and pulling them from departments to the extent that there is um, job responsibility gaps that need to be um, essentially fulfilled in departments that are already kind of experiencing significant vacancies, just, you know, a, a mindful approach of a backfilling quickly and figuring out how we're going to recruit or readjusting resources quickly to, so that there isn't a service gap level 
drop or gap with that. So hopefully y'all are having those conversations with the impacted departments. So certainly, 1,000%. Um, in fact, uh, we there's we can go deep down that rabbit hole uh, as, as you would like. Um, but the, the, again, the goal is with the knowledge of what uh, needs to happen in, um, in our planning department, specifically as it relates to zoning and permitting, we want to create as much uh, as much flexibility within that department so that they can staff up uh, very, very quickly. As it relates to your question about the operational nature, what we've tried to do is essentially separate the policymakers from the operators and so those folks uh, in the office of housing that office in and of itself is about 25 people we're only moving seven right and so those seven individuals are, are the policy making folks anyway um, and they're coming over to the policy shop and so the the, the remainder uh, the bulk of those folks will actually remain in planning and now they'll have an additional um, eight or so seven or so uh, FTEs to staff up as they see fit I, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Planning is the biggest concern. I mean, to be honest with you, it's just uh, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling already in terms of um, having enough hands uh, on deck. So um, just uh, extra focus on your part and the administration's part um, as we're moving this, making this transition to, to make sure there's no dip there. Um, and my last question, I did um, at the MPUF meeting last week, um, uh, Ms. Meriday, Dr. Meriday, I should say, was there already. Um, presenting and, and, and sharing her role as a neighborhood ombudsman and I, I still there's still angst and concern on my part in terms of confusion within the our communities our neighborhoods as to who they're supposed to go to um, for what like when is it the MPU planner when is it the office of constituent services and when is it um, uh, the neighborhood ombudsman and when is it us and so that piece, I'll be honest with you, is still not clear to me, which means I have to suspect it's not clear to my constituents. It may be clear to others, but I don't know what, how you can help us and me figure out what the narrative is, but I, I do think before we get, this gets too far out of the gate, we need to figure that out. Um, because the other thing I don't want to do is is create one where if they go to one person, don't like the answer, then they'll go to another person until they get the answer they like, or they get overpromised something along the way, and then it ends up landing back on us to try and, you know, reconcile who they heard from what. So I don't I don't know if you have any comments um, or or feedback from me on that. I'll say generally, uh, I think I, I think generally. Um, creating a government that is transparent, accessible, and has hands who can answer phones and uh, return calls and address issues, the more of those folks is a generally a good thing. I think to your point, being crystal clear about who does what is incumbent upon um, the mayor's administration to uh, to divide and conquer, uh, if you will. And so if you bring an issue, candidly, if you bring me an issue um, about trash pickup, I'm going to get that issue to the right person. And Dr. Meriday, uh, our folks down uh, in planning who run our MPU shop, our folks in co constituent services can get our constituents and you to where you need to be. Um, Dr. Meriday's job is essentially, again, to step out, do a broad look across the organization and compare issues that we see exist across MPUs and then elevate those issues and allow um, uh, you all as well as the mayor to decide whether or not this is an issue that requires a broader policy solution. And so uh, she's not designed to, to necessarily be the constituent services person per se. And y'all need to give her a better script because that's exactly how she, if y'all have any issues, contact me. I'm in the mayor's office. It's exactly what I was nervous about when, okay. um, when I when we brought this up last time. It's just that clarification will be provided. Yeah, I mean, I, I I know how you're articulating it, and I know how it looks on paper, but you know, you got to think about it from the public side how they're receiving it. Yeah, all I, they're I, hearing I, is I got someone else I can go ask that's directly. I will I will say this. I think I, I would hope that the goal, if I show up in an MPU meeting, I don't do anything day to day as it relates to. Um, trash pickup. I want to make my myself accessible uh, to everybody in that MPU meeting. In fact, that, that, that is a part of the mayor's expectation. And so to be, to be quite candid about that is, you know, if, you, you've, if you've seen the mayor interact with the community, he actually kind of demands almost that we issue our, all of our phone numbers, that we he are always engaging with people. And so I think rarely will you find a member, hopefully, rarely will you, will you find a member of this administration show up in a room 
and not offer help or not offer a conduit of service. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not questioning that piece of sure. it. I do think it is is function. It is sure. kind of very, a, a very clear description of hey, I can take your uh, your concerns or whatever, but my job is is kind of like you said is to I'm scanning across all MPUs and looking for common issues and, and strat build you know that I can take back and we develop a citywide policy um, or strategy on. So just uh, I'm just asking you to help us on this one because I, I can see it now. Um, now, granted, nothing has come out of the MPUF meeting, but it, as soon as I heard the questions to her, I was like, okay, I can see a, a dangerous um, um, couple of steps ahead. So, all right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to other colleagues that have questions. Council Member Shook. Despite my misgivings, I'm going to support this. Here's why. We're the grassroots. We're, we're between the administration and the citizens. It's not anyone else. It's not an ombudsman. It's nobody else but us. And so what's not going to change is when we get complaints, we're going to go straight to the commissioner. Those of us who have served with the mayor will go straight to the mayor. We're not going to subjugate ourselves to anybody else. That's not going to change. I'm done. All right, other questions or comments? All right, we do have a motion on the floor uh, to, uh, that's been properly seconded to approve on substitute. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries this item is approved. Thank you, Mr. Ring. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. All right, um, moving on. Next item is 23-01014. It's an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to deposit all outstanding and future revenue received by the City of Atlanta from the Metropolitan Rapid Transit Authority, or MARTA. Um, actually, it should be Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, pursuant to the Intergovernmental Agreement, IGA, uh, authorized by resolution number 07R2512, and equal shares into accounts managed by the Department of City Planning and the Department of Public Works. And for other purposes, administration asks us to hold this. I'll make the motion to hold. I'll entertain a second. Second. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote to hold. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. Motion carries. This item will be held. Next item, 23-01049, an ordinance by Councilmember Marcy Collier Overstreet, authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the Department of Finance to enter into amendment number six to contract number listed, ATL cloud implementation and post-implementation support services with Deloitte Consulting LLP for FY24 revenue forecast model updates in an amount not to exceed $50,000 and zero cents. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Go ahead, Mr. Davis, you have the floor. Good afternoon, council members. Lawrence Davis, Revenue Chief for the Office of Revenue. Uh, the legislative before you today is basically we are requesting an amendment of the existing agreement with Deloitte Consulting that pertains specifically to the financial and economic advisory support service portion of the agreement. It is the uh, Department of Finance desire that Deloitte will provide us with an updated macro and micro, micro economic uh, assumptions and identify any potential economic outlooks that may impact the city's revenue drivers as we prepare for the FY22 revenue forecast model. All right, questions for Mr. Davis. Motion from Shook to approve. Second. Seconded by Marcy Collier Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries that item is approved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, well, colleagues, if there are no objections, I'm going to take items six, seven, and nine together. First one is 23-01051, an ordinance by Council Member Andrea L. Boone, authorizing the transfer of $15,000.00 from the Council District 10 Carry Forward account to the Council District 10 Expense and Distribution account to continue serving the Atlanta community for the public good and for other purposes. Item number seven is 23-01057, an ordinance by Councilman Michael Julian Bond, authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $500.00 from the post one at-large carry forward account to the Center for Civil and Human Rights and for other purposes. And item number nine is 23-01065, an ordinance by council members Antonio Lewis, Jason Winston, and Matt 
Westmoreland, authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $5,000.00 to Carver High School to assist with purchasing a basketball scoreboard and for other purposes. Any discussion or questions on those three items? I'll entertain a motion, for, uh, motion from Winston. Is there a second? From Hillis. So Winston and Hillis, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. Those three items are approved. All right, next item is number eight. All right, colleagues, there is a substitute for this that uh, changes the caption. So I will read the new caption in and then make the motion to bring uh, this forward. It's 23-01059. Um, um, an ordinance by Councilmember Jason Dozier is substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into a sole source agreement number listed inspectors fleet parking with Park Place Operations Inc., a Georgia corporation formerly known as Parking Company of America Inc., a Georgia corporation, to rent parking spaces at 162 and 164 Forsyth Street, 168 Forsyth Street, and a portion of 2060 Broad Street, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, as further described herein, pursuant to Section 2-1191 of the City of Atlanta Code of Warrances, on behalf of the Department of City Planning for a term of three years, commencing retroactively on February 1st, 2023, ending January 31, 2026, in an amount of $120,000 annually with one one-year renewal option with a 3% escalation upon the one-year renewal with city legislative approval, authorizing all expenditures to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein and for other purposes. The substitute adds the sole source agreement number and changes the expiration date in the caption as well as revises the language in the, in the body to reflect that. I made a motion to bring the substitute forward. Is there a second? Seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. Substitute is before us. Mr. Pace. Good afternoon, Chair, Committee, and um, Council Members. It, in a nutshell, our inspectors' parking lot that they're using now, they're getting kicked out, being evicted. We need somewhere else to park. So this is essentially a three-year contract with a one-year extension with Parking Corporation of America to utilize the other parking spaces up, basically up the street on Forsyth Street. So, All right. Any questions for Mr. Pace? I'm just curious, do, can you tell us how many spaces? 80 parking spaces is what they allotted. 80. 80. Yes. Other questions? All right. I'll make a motion to approve on substitute. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Marcy Collier Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. <laughs> Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Thank you. All right, that takes care of ordinances. We'll now go to resolutions. 23-R3081, a resolution by Councilmember Michael Julian Bond, urging the Department of Procurement to develop a program to provide regular in-person training opportunities to prospective buyer suppliers and to offer the option for contractors to hand deliver bid proposals in an effort to increase the opportunities for participation of women, minority, and small businesses in the city's procurement process and for other purposes. Um, does the CPO want to come up and say anything uh, to this paper? Jadeep Majumdar, uh, Chief Procurement Officer for City of Atlanta. Um, so we, uh, you know, when we looked at this paper, um, our strong urge is to still continue using Oracle for everything that we do. We have supply trainings that have been scheduled, and we will continue training our suppliers on a periodic basis. We have all the information about supply training on atlsupplies.com. We have supply trainings in our Oracle module, and we also have supply training um, scheduled that's mentioned on Instagram, on Twitter, as well as uh, um, LinkedIn, not TikTok, but 
It's <laughs> <laughs> So having said that, we are always open to suggestions from suppliers. If the supply needs any help, you know, we have, they have contact information and we'll be more than happy to help them, guide them through the process. All right. Uh, questions or comments? I'll make a comment here. I had a, a conversation with the CPO as well as um, uh, Mr. Pace on this one. I, I just fundamentally disagree with this paper. I, I think we, we're moving backwards if we do this. Um, I literally just took a, a training program with my other job that was completely online um, this past Monday. And the benefit and beauty of that is that they're archived and anyone else can go in and, and uh, access those. And the paper bid process, again, I don't know of any other um, agency that's using, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking about Fulton County, DeKalb County, the state of Georgia, everything is done digitally for both accountability purposes, transparency purposes, and quite frankly, if we get challenged, um, on anything, the research capabilities of our system in, are invaluable in protecting the city in terms of our processes. So um, I just, I have a, a, a real challenge with this. I see the author of the paper, and I don't know if Mr. Bond, you want to um, speak to anything here before uh, I make a motion on this, this paper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for our CPO. And I just want to say for the record, I have uh, ultimate confidence in our CPO, and I've said so uh, at various committee meetings. But I introduced this paper after consulting with the uh, council staff, uh, but it is actually related to another paper that's on the agenda of some issues that are surrounding the other paper. So we wanted to make sure that we, uh, out of abundance of caution, had a statement that uh, made sure that those who are involved or invited to participate in our procurement process are fully versed uh, in the process and that there is a reoccurring effort to educate those who have traditionally participated in that process and those who may be new to it. I, I, think, it's a, uh, I think that's a fair uh, suggestion. I am. Um, and I, I think the CPA will take that part. I just, ha however, still, again, like I said, disagree with, uh, I feel like this paper moves us backwards in terms of process and, and technology and um, the way other municipalities are, are handling procurement. Um, so, and, and I will say, just so for the benefit of the colleagues that were not on the briefing call, item number 11, the next one, um, we cannot, uh, law has advised us not to speak on that one at all. It is still an act of procurement. Um, when that one comes up, I'm going to make, immediately make a motion to file um, to keep us out of, since we're in the blackout period for, for that particular procurement. Um, but Mr. Bond, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say about the, the one before us right now. Well, I just hope that we would support it because even though there are uh, electronic computer uh, places, I mean systems in place, uh, the issues surrounding both of these papers, it was revealed that that system failed. That's why these papers are before you today. And I would hope that you would not file it, but probably hold it until the process is over because it's, it's there as a statement for those who had issues. But, you know, of course, we cannot discuss them. That, you know, so, something did happen that was not ideal. All right. Uh, I appreciate the caution around here. I do want to ask JD, uh, our CPO. Um, have we had any other either challenges to cl previously closed or awarded um, uh, procurements that have raised issues about in-person trainings or the ability to deliver paper responses? I have been here six months now, and uh, so far this is, this is the first one. We have never heard from anyone. In fact, none of the suppliers as of today have also complained about Oracle or Oracle's downtime? Um, yeah, I, I haven't either. I, colleagues, I don't know if anybody else has anything to say. And Mr. Bond, I, I respect what you're doing. Again, I, if I'm just looking specifically at the policy that this paper would establish, um, I, I fundamentally disagree with it and, and think that we are moving backwards. And with that, I, I'm actually going to put forward a motion to file this because I, I, I can't envision a scenario in which we as a city would want 
to go down this path or, or again, unwind the work, the hard work that, that has been done to reform our procurement and bring it into the 21st century. Um, but, you know, I, I don't disagree with the work that's been done to bring us into the 21st century. But I do know that the procurement task force that was established last term made this recommendation. So when they looked at how our procurement process should be reformed, and, you know, we've been blessed that we've got one of the best procurement directors in the country, and I, I want everybody to know that. This is not questioning, you know, his abilities or the way that he's managed things. But when you're asking uh, companies that are smaller, uh, that are minority-owned, female-owned, and they're investing uh, tens of thousands of dollars into procurement applications and things happen where their investment in their application is not accepted on our side of the fence and we're inviting them to come to participate in our process I don't think that's fair there needs to be a way uh, beyond when systems fail that if we're going to invite people in to, to bid that we have a way to accept uh, the things that they've invested in to bid in our process Right, and I, I feel like the other the other path is, as you've heard, the system hasn't failed over the last six months. And in an instance, if there is a Oracle failure, and for example, the folks can't um, submit, then there is grounds, in my opinion, for a, a rebid. Um, and, and if there is a systemic hardware failure or whatever, then, then that is an option that the procurement officer already, always has. But this is simply, is essentially asking them to reintroduce a paper process versus just reacting to one-off system problems. Does that make sense? Do you hear what I'm saying on that one? Well, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but but basically what happens is that without talking about the issues, I'll do a hypothetical. If if it's hypothetical in a hypothetical situation, if people are trying to access our window and our window is not accessible and you give notice to people in the office that it's not accessible there needs to be another way for people to submit their bids before the deadline because the issue of whether or not the system has failed is in dispute uh, the issue has been brought to me and several other council members so okay uh, I appreciate the feedback um, I have a motion to file. I, I, is there a second on that? And if there isn't one, then are you second? All right, it's so a second from Shook. So we'll go ahead and take that vote. If that motion fails, then we can entertain a, a separate motion. So the motion, let's go ahead. If there's no further discussion, let's open that vote to file. The vote is open. The vote is closed. All right, six yeas, zero nays, the motion carries. So, Mr. Bond, appreciate your feedback. Ms. Collier, Overstreet, you wanted to speak. Yeah, I'd like to speak. Um, I was going to speak before we voted, but I do want to speak on my vote. Um, I publicly advocated for um, a new process, which I do believe our CPO has brought to us um, as far as accountability is concerned. And I also have advocated for um, automation and using our system, the Oracle system, in the proper way, using a form, a, a, a pro, in a proper way, using some of the, um, the tools of Oracle that we've not used that have been available to us. And, you know, our, our new CPO has really been using all of that. So I am of the mindset that we really need to let this play out more. Um, I've received no complaints in, since he's been here about the system. So. Uh, for that reason, um, that's why I would not like to change the course of where we are now because it does feel like we're moving past um, an era where we were, where I felt like a mediator, um, yeah. literally, on council, and I don't think that council should ever be in the process of procurement. Um, and I did feel like that many times, and, and so far we've just been going, everything's been fine, and I want to keep it like that. I don't want to, midway of the uh, Commissioner Jadi being, uh, doing his new role, implementing um, something that is not on his um, platform. All right, thank you, Ms. Overstreet. No further comments on that. Let's go ahead and move on.
Did you want to say something else? Yeah, one, uh, one last thing. Uh, the next quarterly update that I have, I'll be more than happy to share all the automation and enhancements that we have done. So it's, it's really nice. We are leveraging Oracle capabilities to the full extent. We have made changes and will continue making changes down the road. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, the next item, 23-R3082, it's a resolution by Council Member Michael Julian Bond requesting that the City of Atlanta Department of Procurement suspend the award of a contract for contract number listed, small architectural and engineering design services at, at Hartsfield at Jackson Atlanta International Airport and resolicit bids and to ensure that women, minority, and small businesses have equal access to the city's competitive bidding process and for other purposes. I'll move to file. Is there a second? Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six days, zero nays. That motion carries this item uh, will be filed. All right, next item is 23-R3084. There is a substitute for this that does change the amount in the caption and the binding clause. So I'll read that the new caption in and make the motion to bring it forward. It's a resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone. Author, as substituted by Finance Executive Committee, authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute the Third Amendment to Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, FC 9726, Wireless Communication Devices, Voice and Data Services with Verizon Wireless Services, LLC, on behalf of the Department of Atlanta Information Management, to extend the term of the agreement effective January 31, 2023, through June 30, 2024, and add additional funding in an amount not to exceed $5,994,000 $854.52, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Motion is to bring the substitute Second. forward. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. The motion carries. The substitute is before us, Ms. Neela Dudley. Good afternoon. My name is Tamika Neely Dudley, Atlanta Information uh, Management, IT Director. This legislation um, presented to you today is for the Verizon Wireless for our city devices that's issued out to our city department um, in use. Um, the legislation covers over a period of 17 months to align with the city's fiscal year and the underlying cooperative agreement and also the city's fiscal um, year. Um, the previous amend amendments that were presented was to extend out an additional six months due to the underlying agreement expiring and the new co-op, co co I'm sorry, was still in negotiations with DTA um, and the wireless carriers. We did notice that there was an increase um, between FY21 and FY23, and that was merely because of during the pandemic there was a requirement for additional devices um, to support telework, um, call center transitioning fully to home, and um, employees working from home, and additional staffing needs by the departments. Um, however, for FY24, there is a decrease, decreased by 1.3 compared to FY23. We do have a long-term plan to do an RFP solicitation so that we can do a competitive bid to get other mobile carriers to come in and provide some pricings for their services. And short-term, we'll work with the departments to do recommendations as far as quarterly audits um, to see if there are any zero to low usage where we can suspend services with no cost or disconnect services. Thank you. Any questions? There's a motion from Shook to approve on substitute. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. And thank you for the explanation about the amount change. The vote is no open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved Thank you. on substitute. All right, next item, 23-R3095. There is a substitute for this. And colleagues, I rec recognize that this is highly unusual paper. Uh, resolution by Council Member Alex Wan is substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to refund customers for overpayments to water and sewer accounts in an amount of $131,530.79. All funds will be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers listed and for other purposes. I'll move Second. to bring the uh, substitute forward, seconded by Shook. Uh, Mr. Westmoreland, are you going to comment after the substitute is before us? Thank you. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open.
The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The substitute is before us. Mr. Westmoreland. I just want to thank you for your groundbreaking work on that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, um, yeah, uh, vanguard legislation. All right, is there any discussion on this paper? All right, there's a motion from Shook to approve on substitute. Second. Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved uh, on substitute. All right, next item is 23-R3100, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to refund Sharon Denise Hodges, the former property owner of 4395 Bakers Ferry Road, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30331, for lien overpayment in an amount of $7,438.29. All funds to be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers uh, account number listed and for other purposes. Motion from Shook to approve. Is there seconded by Hillis? Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved. Uh, all right, next item is 23-R3101, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number listed for contract number listed, job order contracting services small with HCR Construction, Inc. for office renovations for the Department of Procurement on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $2,800,000.00 all work to be charged to and paid from accounts listed in for other purposes. Colleagues, we need to amend this paper to insert the account number and correct the function activity code and second resolve clause. You have a copy of that in your packet. I'll move to amend. Seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote to amend, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The amended paper is before us. All right, Mr. Dale, you floor. Greetings, Chair uh, and committee members. Remy Santo, Commissioner of Department of Enterprise Asset Management. The legislation is as indicated and it is to do the repairs for the Department of Procurement. All right, any questions for the Commissioner? Seeing, seeing none, there's a motion from Shook to approve uh, as amended, seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion is carries. The item is approved as amended. All right, that takes us to dual referreds. We've already dispensed with number 16. Did number 17 make it out of public safety yesterday? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right, uh, so we don't have any dual referreds ready uh, for action, correct? Other than the ones you disposed yeah, already, of, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so that takes us to papers uh, um, held in committee. Uh, we have two that are coming off. Um, the first one is item 27, which is 22-0-1736. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee to amend Chapter 114, Personnel, Article 4, Classification Plan of the Code of Ordinances, City of Atlanta, Georgia, so as to provide for certain position abolishments, creations, reclassifications, class creations, above entry authorizations, employee position transfers, position funding allocation changes and for and other personnel actions in line with the FY 2023 budget corrections and for other purposes. I'll make a motion to bring forward the substitute Second. the, seconded by Shook. Let's go ahead and take care of that transaction first. Um, let's open that vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Uh, motion carries. The substitute is before us. All right, Commissioner and colleagues, in the packet that was sent out, there was uh, not only the, the list of transactions, but also a summary sheet um, of the departments and the actual actions taken. So, all right, uh, Commissioner, you have the floor. My last, last, first again. <laughs> 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 Through the chair again. Um, basically, this personnel paper uh, seeks to, well, first of all, there are 803 actions, but the bulk of it is to really clean up what has transpired and moving a lot of the extra help positions that, are, that have incumbents, FTEs in them into positions so in doing that that's the the bulk of what took place here and you can see um, on your cheat sheet that um, some of the other transactions are there but a lot of it is clean up in anticipation for the upcoming budget process all right questions for the commissioner so as, aside from general just 
kind of affecting the budget uh, that we did back in June. Cleanups. The other thing that comes to mind, obviously, is the creation of the uh, or policy. reshuffling of the office of the chief policy officer. Yes. Anything else um, that I'm not recalling? New actions since? No. We haven't take. We haven't created any other. No, there's nothing that stands out or that's different from what we presented here. Okay. Uh, we've dealt with everything, and if anything comes up in the interim, I know that there are some. There were a few positions that were at issue, but you discussed that today with uh, Mr. English. So other than that, I think we're okay. And the salary grade uh, amendment, I see that we have 37 of those actions. Those are all, were they contemplated in the budget or they decisions or actions deemed necessary since then? Probably deemed necessary <laughs> then because a lot of the mission critical positions or positions where we're making the adjustments that I spoke to earlier uh, in the quarterly report some things we just have to deal with right now in order for retention purposes or recruitment purposes. And I, I do those or make those decisions or have those discussions with uh, CFO Bala before we make uh, any requests. All right, and CFO Bala, in those instances, it's basically just to, do you have the capacity in your Correct. line item? Yeah, and, and a lot of the uh, actions were already contemplated in the adoption of the FY23 budget, and then these actions lagged afterwards. Um, you know, ideally, the the um, budget impact personnel actions usually have been in conjunction with the personal paper that we see during the budget development process. This is usually cleanup work. Thank you. Mr. Shuck, you have the floor. Yeah, so um, before you got here, you had never dealt with anything called a personnel paper. <laughs> sure didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to ask, now that you've been here a minute, what's your assessment? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> is the mayor watching? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, he's not, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, evaluating this process, I know I've mentioned it to you in my individual meetings that I had, and I'd like to have more meetings because there are things that are done legislatively that I can, we could probably move a lot faster administratively. Uh, so this process, um, although it is necessary, there are different ways that it can be done. And I'm only speaking from the H my HR vantage point, but I think having discussions with other um, areas or departments within the organization, I've had some conversations with the CFO about some things that you know impact the way that we do business in HR, and we can be a bit more efficient if all of the legislation didn't have to come, you know, through um, this process the way that it does. And, and that some of those are reclassifications and things like that are, I routinely have done you know, in my career as administrative actions as the uh, CHRO of an organization. And it sometimes, cre well, oftentimes creates a bottleneck or stops me from doing certain things or the organization from doing certain things or moving as quickly as we'd like to. And I did want to get your feedback on it because I appreciate your you know, commitment to the job and getting things done a little more quickly. I, I will, I'll say this. And I've never heard of any other government that goes through this. However, from our perspective, I will say that every now and then, via a personnel paper, we'll catch something that we would never otherwise ever see that's important. And so as much of a pain in the butt as it is, probably going to take a lot to unclench our fingers around it yes. unless the proposed alternative provides us with an equal or better window into who's really trying to do what Ooh, to I can bring one who's trying to do what to who yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, great um, yes I've had some discussions around that and and, and really you know all uh, I guess cheekiness aside I, what we want to do is most you know, efficient and transparent and because a lot of the challenges that we face in terms of some of the recruitments or some of the retention is because we can't get, we may not be able to get to you fast enough or it may not come before you to make that decision in time. So um, being able to do some of these things are truly pencil whip administrative things based on the assessment. But I want to put this council and the organization in a position where they can look at HR and our, you know, financial position from an HR perspective transparently enough that you are comfortable with the decisions that can be made 
administratively um, in the department or that there's enough information that you have at your fingertips or the dashboard based on what we're trying to build that you're comfortable being able to look into certain situations and see for yourself that, okay, I don't have a problem with that. But we have to build that for you. You have not been able to see that or experience it, so I understand. Thank you, Mr. Chuck. Mr. Westmoreland. You know, it's been a minute since I said back at APS, we used to do it this way. Um, but back at APS, we used to do it a lot. We would do it every month, and there would be a report that the board would get, and it would list all of these things um, that had taken place in the preceding 30 days. Um, so if this process isn't working, there's one across the street that might work quicker and better. Okay. Well, I mean, we get these numbers, I mean, No, she doesn't need to check it out. She knows what she's doing. I'm saying yes. I'm down to, to change the process. <laughs> <laughs> down to change the process. Let's do whatever we need to do so you can hire people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Appreciate Council that Member. feedback. Thank you. Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, a few questions. Number one, I'm <clears throat> just looking at the big numbers on the chart. Um, but under DPW, there's 122 position transfers. Is that because of the solid waste uh, fund changes or were those positions? 120 or 20? What's that? 120. 122 in DPW under position transfers. Uh, some of those positions may be extra help transitioning in. Uh, yeah, those are related. Oh, the to general fund to solid waste. Common good services solid. are being funded by the general fund now. With that legislation that was adopted in yes, fiscal year 22, yeah. What I suggested the Correct. transfer from general Correct. to Correct. from solid waste. Right, to solid waste fund to general fund supported by that 20 million dollar allocation. <clears throat> Other question being the uh, public safety chair um, may not have them in front of you now, but if I could get details on uh, both the only APD has uh, position abolishments, and then both have a number of position creations. If I could get uh, the feedback on uh, sworn versus non-sworn of those positions uh, by the next, before this comes up at council. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? I'll, I'll make one last observation though. I mean, I, if, I see that, I mean, if I, this isn't really com completely accurate, but if we look at abolishments versus creations, it still it seems like a net plus and I do think based on you know the comments that I made during your presentation I do think we need to be watching that very closely um, and making sure um, that we're going in the right direction that both matches business practices as well as you know even before we get the pay and class study back um, where we should be in terms of staffing and organizational structure Yes, and that, there are meetings that we are having still with departments, and now um, a part of, you know, I was running from you all early after I did my quarterly report, and I forgot to introduce my team, but uh, we've rounded out the HR team, and I'm in a position now that we can take a deeper dive with the, the subject matter experts to have those discussions about the operational needs of the departments. When we did our um, position vacancy audit at the beginning when I first got here, we were able to just look at the ones that were like super dated and now we're looking at it from an operational standpoint saying that now we did that first look let's really look at what you from an operational standpoint what you really need what you're using and what you've been able to function with or without and also in the context of who can work who needs to be boots on the ground and who could, who should telework in order to retain talent because we're getting that uh, demand as well quite a bit yeah i think sounds like we're gonna you know with that analysis and you're filling out the team and this other report coming in we're gonna have an opportunity to sharpen our pencils in a way that both serves our staff better um yes. as well as our, our constituents so i um, look forward to that council member overstreet you have the floor yeah so when when are we expecting that study to be before us uh before i council. want to say this first uh of the study like mm -hmm. finished mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, now, <laughs> I know. Um, let me just say this. We just signed the contract back in November. And when I say sign the contract, I actually coming on as the new HR commissioner, sat down, went through the contract, 
you know, combed through everything and had to go back to the vendor and have a discussion about clarification because we've been through class and comp studies and we've since hired a class and compensation director who has experience in that arena. Uh, Ms. Merlandi Vincent is somewhere in here. Um, but with that, uh, now having Ms. Vincent here and having done some of the cleanup, we want to be postured to receive that information. And part of that is our data cleanup and everything that we've done before. We're inviting them to come in hopefully in this first quarter, but I can tell you it, it won't take this long, so don't freak out when I tell you this. <laughs> the last one that I did was six years. It wasn't six years me doing it. I went into the organization and I, get, I was given like maybe five months to wrap it up. What happens when this type of company comes in, it just depends on how you allow them to come into the organization. We want to have a very controlled approach when they come in to make sure this is the data that we need you to look at. This is your working group. This is their schedule over the next three months. This is how much time you have to work with them. If you run into any challenges, this is your point person who you need to deal with. Not because, you know, if you don't do that, they come in and they go, we're everywhere. We need this, we need that, we need this, we need that. You know, we didn't get this, you know, it, it's all over the place. So with that focused effort, we're hoping to cut it down, but I don't anticipate six years. I don't anticipate, anticipate three years. The fact that we're able to prepare, I can't speak to it because I need to see their timelines, but I can promise you within the next month or so after we have this first meeting, we can pretty much chart out when they're coming in in phases. The other piece of that um, that I think is very important that we have not discussed um, as an organization publicly is that we need to properly message a class classification and compensation study. Right. And when I say that, um, we need a marketing plan around it for our internal customers mm -hmm. and make sure because when people hear class and comp, whoo, I'm getting a raise. Not really. <laughs> it's right. not for every single classification. And also the fiscal impact of it, once we have that, it may be something that the city did not anticipate from a fiscal standpoint, right. and we may have to phase it out over the next few years. So, and, and, I, and that's where this question is, is coming from. Um, I'm looking at the uh, personnel paper actions on this, on this uh, particular snapshot that you've shared with us, and I see where we have employee salary adjustments for just um, one department, and we know that can't be right because it's, it's time for us to really know who should be paid what and actually start um, retaining our talent by yes. paying people for what uh, the work that they do. And so that's why I asked about the study because I want to go into our budget cycle with that information. And if we're not talking about this budget cycle, I just wanted to know that. But it is good to know that you will know in about a month or so what the timeline looks like. If not, that's going to be one of my goals and objectives because that's important. Like we really need to start matching this, um, these positions up with the proper um, salary. Yes. And we, so far, like it's a huge gap on, on this um, chart. And that's Agreed. why people are happy to go if they find something better. And that's not what we want. And this is done biannually here? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and if it's any consolation to you, we take a deep dive when we see that we have a challenge with talent, um, especially during the exit interview process, to give the city an, an opportunity to retain that talent. We make a point of having those discussions, and I've been able to um, socialize some of the challenges with uh, CFO Ball and say, listen, this is where we're going to have gaping holes in the event that this happens, and what can we do here? But I, I normally go to administration first if I find out, and that's another reason why looking at the metrics, if we see movement in certain departments or we get you know, anxiety from any of the commissioners, it's like, wait a second, let us see, it's mission critical, it's going to create a gap. Let's take a step back, have a conversation with the CFO and see if we can deal with this now, and let them know, yes, the class and, uh, class and comp study is coming, but some of these things we will not be able to um, always wait on. So um, I, I say that cautiously but optimistically because I don't want anyone to run with that and say, well, look at my job, look at my job, look at my job. Right. I can't do that right now. Mm -hmm. But from an operational standpoint where we have the efficient inefficiencies or it's going to create gridlock or public safety or life safety issues, we're going to address those immediately. And I will definitely go to CFO Bala and administration and say, listen, we got to do something. But other than that, uh, we want to take the global approach and make sure that we do mm -hmm. something holistically for the organization. But I, I can tell you in the marketplace, we need to 
make some changes. Yes. And not only to compensation, uh, we also need to make sure that people understand what the benefits component is and that that adds, you know, that's value and, you know, yes. a teleworking component. So yes, we're looking at it holistically. And when I say I'm coming back in a month, um, that's after meeting with um, the vendor, uh, Evergreen, and once we meet with Evergreen, they will tell us their timeline. So I can't say it's starting in the month, and that's why I don't want to tell you it's starting next month or this month, yeah. but I will hold them to definitely first quarter start, and with that, we told them that when you come in, I need a timeline because I have to communicate with my leadership and legislators that this is where we are, and it's probably going to come in phases. They probably won't come in and say, we're going to be done on, you know, in June of 2024. Mm -hmm. In fact, if they tell me that, it'll make me nervous. <laughs> because they don't even know what they're looking at. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. so, okay, as long as it's top of mind and you know that that's something that's important for us, we do need um, the ongoing communication and some type of timeline for it. Thank you. Will do. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also say, I mean, this practice of only twice a year doing a personal paper, I mean, if we find a different process, one, or I, I feel like we're in a very unique situation right now, market conditions, um, our staffing levels, it could warrant, you know, kind of waiving that pr previous practice if that's what we need to do to stay. Ooh. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's important. I mean, we've got departments who've got 20% vacancies or higher. We, we, that means we, the market is telling us we got to do something. Correct. And so, you know, we look to you to, to advise us and let's not be handcuffed by this unspoken rule that we only do, do this twice a year. So, Great. Thank for you that for that. So, as long as for the rest of this year as I'm chair of this committee. <laughs> all bets are off January 1, 2024. So. Uh -oh. All right. Um, any other discussion for the commissioner? And do we have a motion? All right. Motion from Westmoreland to approve on substitute. Second. By um, one more thing. I didn't during my presentation thank my team. I think it's very important that I do that. I haven't, and I have new team members that I need, just wanted to introduce because they may be um, interacting with your office on my behalf on certain issues. Um, I we'll did, take, I'm sorry, the vote is open. Yeah, let, let's oh, the vote. vote sorry. And then we'll have, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Is it closed? The timeout. I'm sorry. We have a time, the, the vote is closed. Five A's, zero nays, the motion carries, the item is approved on substitute. So now congratulations to you and then you can congratulate uh, your team as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a deputy commissioner of, what is it? Um, which one do I want to do first? Uh, <laughs> <The> personal paper. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Compliance and regulation, Candace Colas. And these are new. I mean, the, the rest of the HR superstars are here too, so we don't want to disregard them. Um, Daniel Nichols, of course, has been here. Uh, we have Robin Mams, Director of Legislation and Contracts Administration. So she'll be helping me, along with Ms. Colas, work on those new options for you. Um, we have Mr. Michael Nathaniel from our benefits. He's our new Director of Benefits. Merlandi Vincent is Classification and Compensation. Uh, Anthony Roberts, Talent Acquisition and everything else that I don't know how to do. <laughs> um, who else do we have? This no, Cherise. I don't see Cherise. Oh, she's hiding behind Kevin. Cherise Isaac, HRIS guru, who is streamlining a lot of things that we have and in, in getting that monthly report. So the numbers that you see, I don't know if you remember seeing by department, we get those on a weekly basis now. So we can look at them. And if you want months in and you want to look at it, see how things are moving, that you don't have to wait till the end of the year or mid year to get that. But with this personnel complement and rounding out the team, I mean, I'm grateful that the organization has been able to support us that way, but it is really going to allow us to really move forward in HR uh, with the SMEs that we brought on. And my regular superstars, thank you all, everybody who always helps us out. Basically, fasten your seatbelts where we're going. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, colleagues, we have one more paper coming off of held, and that's item number 33, 22-01239. There is a substitute for this that changes the caption. I'll go ahead and read that in. This is an ordinance by Council Members Bond, Amos, Lewis, Faroki, Dozier, uh, Collier Overstreet, and Waits, as amended by Community Development Human Services Committee, and as substituted by Finance Executive Committee, authorizing a donation to Second Helpings Atlanta in an amount not to exceed $20,000 and zero cents to support initiatives to provide free meals to the City of Atlanta residents facing food insecurities 
authorizing the mayor or his designee and or the chief financial officer to execute any documents or donation agreements necessary to effectuate this don donation, authorizing the chief financial officer to charge to and pay the donation authorized hereby from the account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. I'll make a motion to bring the for substitute forward. Can't get seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Uh, the motion carries the substitute is before us. Um, I, a couple of comments I just want to make about this. Number one is I, I do, um, this has opened up a lot of d dialogue with uh, Second Helpings. Um, they remain a committed partner to the city. I think they're just continuing to do a great work. I think. Uh, and are interested in, in uh, expanding that relationship uh, somehow to help serve our um, our constituents and our residents. Um, I, I think we, we should take them up on that offer, and I'll, I look forward to additional conversations um, with the administration about this. Um, and this changes it to a direct donation to Second Helpings. Um, uh, Mr. Bond, I see you walk in, and, and we'll give you the floor. Uh, I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve on substitute. We did bring it forward already, right? Okay, I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve on substitute, seconded by Hillis, uh, as Mr. Bond's approaching the podium. We're not in this alone. Well, thank you, yes. We worked out an accommodation to make sure the program continues. Um, this is what I was planning to do with the funds from the reimbursements, which I still feel that I'm entitled to for the record, since everyone voted for it back in March. But Second Helpings is the direct recipient of the donation of the food from HelloFresh. And of course, HelloFresh has been distributed in every council district of the city, most notably six and seven consistently uh, via the Office of International Affairs. So they've actually, you all have actually received more HelloFresh in those two districts than everybody else. But we have been in every district of the city making sure that this happens. But there is a real cost associated with Second Helpings because they do have volunteers that help to break the food down and package it for its distributing, but they have real cost of employees with their refrigerated trucks, with the drivers for those trucks, and with the staff that also assist the volunteers in breaking down the food on a weekly basis. And we're talking about 8,000 meals a week. So when they get the food from HelloFresh early, uh, late night Tuesday, early Wednesday morning, they have to break all that food is not uh, in the packaging. So they have to do that that morning, then it's distributed that afternoon because it is it is fresh, so we appreciate the motion to approve, and we're ready to move ahead. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, there's a motion on the floor. Let's go ahead and open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Thank you very much for your two pieces of fish. Um, all right, so uh, general, uh, any other legislative items um, before us? No, Mr. Okay. Chair. All right, I have one announcement. We've scheduled a work session for fe Wednesday, February 22nd at 9 a.m. Um, this is about the OIG uh, Office of Ethics legislation that's been under held. I'm just trying to kind of keep this moving along in anticipation of changes, make sure it's in time for the budget process. Um, so, Ms. Robinson, I know has done some extensive research. I know you're reaching out to OIG to get more clarification. We're going to all try and converge on that date to talk through all that um, and keep this moving. But please put that on your calendars. Um, and remember that next week is a fifth week, so our next city council member is Monday, February 2nd. Uh, any other announcements? Six. February 6th, sorry. Any other announcements? I have one announcement. Just a reminder, tomorrow the... Department of Finance will be doing an investor conference at the Commerce Club. Um, we have about 140 individuals that we're expecting tomorrow. <clears throat> These are essentially um, various institutional investors who hold City of Atlanta debt. We'll give them an update on our financial condition and give them an update on great things that are happening in the city. There's some great panels tomorrow, anywhere from affordable housing all the way up to economic development. 
It's an invitation for y'all to come if y'all want to come out tomorrow. Is it here? Commerce Club. Okay, I was like, yeah, otherwise we'd have to be on our best behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, yep. And then uh, Councilmember Shook reminded me, also tomorrow uh, is the Buckhead Coalition luncheon, um, so don't forget that uh, on your calendars. Any other announcements or general remarks? Seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you.